You're listening to the Atlanta Dream Center Church Podcast. If you'd like to support this ministry, log on to www.dreamcenterchurch.com, where every dollar advances the kingdom of God. We hope that this message edifies and encourages you to do the great things God has called you to do. We're in a series, if this is your first week here, we're talking about core values. And core values mean values that are like uh, who you are, the, the center of who you are. And as a church, we're going, man, these are the values of us. And when I say us, I don't mean as a staff. We got to break this idea. Church is not, you know, the, the, the pastor and the staff here. The church is us right here. Look around, y'all. This is the church. My, my wife got pumped about that. Come on, Susie. Yeah, that's right, dude. Yeah, that is right. Yeah, you tell them, Susie. Susie's going to take the microphone from me. This is the church. Look at each other. Look at one another, y'all. I know y'all hate when I say look at each other. You guys look dead at me. Look at you guys. Look at dead at me right now. You can't even turn your head a little bit. My gosh. But this is the church. And so when we say, man, this is what describes us as a church. When you're a part of this church, we're saying this is what describes us. And last week we talked about we're going to be a church that prays. And we, we talked about how prayer is maybe the most effective measuring tool for your faith. We talked about, man, you want to you wanna see where you're at with your faith? Check out how much you pray. That will be your measuring tape for your faith. It's an effective one. How many guys think you could pray more? And when here, I, mean, I, I feel like I could pray a lot more, man. And I pray every day. In fact, I pray more than I did last year. And now this year I'm going, man, I feel like I'm still not praying enough. But how many of you guys know people who are crazy in love with Jesus? Anyone know crazy in love with Jesus? They're on fire for Jesus. Have you ever noticed that their prayer life and their faith, if someone is really on fire for God, their prayer life is on fire as well. And your prayer life, and we talked about this last week, man, this has to be a description of who we are as a church. If we're going to be a church body, we need to be people who believe in prayer. We also talked about how prayer actually works. How many of you guys have ever prayed and, and, and you didn't, it didn't work? Anyone ever had that before? Man, I've had that um, a lot. I've had prayers. Anyone have a crazy sad one in here? You don't have to tell me the story. I'm not going to make you come up here. But man, I've had prayer where I prayed for people to get healed and they passed away. Have you guys ever had that? One time, real quick, this is, I'm just telling you the story because I'm going to tell you to read a book is what I'm about to do. So hang in there. But uh, I, one time I was uh, in a fight with my brother, Patrick. Patrick's my older brother and we're, we were bunk buddies. I was on the top bunk. He was on the bottom bunk. So you know that we fought a lot. And one time uh, I told uh, Pat, we're arguing about something and Patrick told me, uh, Tom, uh, God can raise people from the dead, but he's not going to do it through you. I said, you want to bet? I'm like 12 years old. I was like, oh, yes, he will. So you know what my brother did? He said, jump in the car then. So I jumped in the car, and we went to a graveyard. And I went, you guys are all sad. It's okay. I laugh about this one because it's kind of funny. You'll see why in a second. Oh, Penny. So I, I'm, I'm driving, and, and we're in the car, and I'm like sitting in my head like, God, don't let me down on this one. So we get to the graveyard, and I'm out in the graveyard, and I'm just praying over the grave sites, guys. I'm like, just raise from the dead. Holy God, raise him up. Now, while I'm praying, I'm embarrassed because I know my brother Pat is, like, proving a point to me, right? He's trying to tell me that, well, it's not just whatever you pray is going to happen. So I'm like, oh, shoot, man. So I'm over there. I'm, I'm coming there with all the faith I got, and then this thought comes into my mind. What if they are coming alive? They're going to be stuck down there. <laughs> I'm torturing people if they're coming alive, man, you know? <laughs> like, well, coming like, ah, dying again, you know? <laughs> I want to know. They're too deep in the ground. <laughs> After that moment, though, I, did, I struggled for a while about, about prayer. But I want to give you a recommendation for a book because we're not going to talk about that today. And that wasn't my point of talking about this last week. But I know that's a struggle in this church. We, we talk about prayer. And a lot of us don't pray because we don't feel like it works. And I don't have a picture of it, but I want you to write this down. It's a great book. If you can't read well like me, then get audible and listen well, all right? And if you don't listen well, well, then have someone else read it and tell you about it in a short sentence or two. But uh, the book is called The Purpose and Power of Prayer by Dr. Miles Monroe. The Purpose and Power of Prayer by Dr. Miles Monroe. It's a great book. He tackles that head on, and it's fantastic. And I want to encourage you guys to be growing in your walk. But today we're going to be talking about eternally minded well, everyone in here knows what eternity means, right? Yeah? It means forever. It means never ending. It means infinite. And so what do I mean that we're a church? That means we're eternally minded. It means that we aren't a people who build our lives on this earth because we know this is temporal. That's a crazy thought, though. How many of you guys got goals in this life? Anyone got goals in this life? Man, I got, how many, just real quick, how many of you guys want to be rich? Anyone want anyone to be rich, y'all? It's okay, yeah, yeah, it's not, don't be shy. You guys are like, it's not holy to say, I don't want to be rich, all right? It's holy to be honest, okay? That's, that's true holiness. Man, I, I think that would be super cool. I want that Tesla truck. I, I tell Dilly, Dilly, I don't want to look at you because we and you are going to get those Tesla trucks together, man, me and you. I, I love this life on earth, 
But uh, I, I want to just encourage you about living a different way. So first, I want to tell you stories about three people. The first one is about this man. He walked in some city streets for three years naked and, and barefoot. And this was way back in the day. This was before they had street sweepers come through. This was back in the day when sewage was usually a pile on the back of a city. This was when, uh, 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 <laughs> when everything was gross. Anyone in here a germaphobe? Anyone in here have to take a shower at night before you go to bed? Yeah, I just learned this. This is brilliant. You should shower at night so you don't get your dirty body all over your sheets. Yeah, that's, that just makes sense. I know. What a revelation. Write that down. This man walked three years naked and barefoot. Why? He wanted the nation to have an imagery and to humble themselves. So he walked around this nation preaching, and and, and truthfully, it was like a living skit, like a drama, like a play. Like like it was like a huge three-year-long skit. A drama for the city to know that they were going to get captured by a neighboring city. That's why he did it. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you guys would need a lot of money to walk around naked in a city? Anyone in here need a lot of money? You would need a lot of convincing to say, hey, I'm going to walk around naked in the city. That would take a lot. Why? Why would that take a lot? Because of the shame of your name. You're going to have to live the rest of your life with people going, hey, that's that nudist who walks around Atlanta all the time. Like, who's that guy, right? And then you have to bear that for the rest of your life. And then, you know, you, you, your family, your kids would grow up, get made fun of. You have the naked dad, you know, all this stuff. What would make a man do something like that? To be that sold out for the gospel that they would bear it all for three years. To tell you the truth, you and I would say that man is insane. You would give up everything in life for what? Like you could be a Christian and not walk around naked. Like why are you doing this? You could be a Christian and not be hardcore about it. So why in the world would you do this? That man would be crazy. It gets even crazier, dude. This guy was later sawed in half and killed. Sawed in half and killed. I'm not talking about a bullet to the head. I'm talking about a saw while living. That's twisted stuff. But why was this man able to do this? This man's name, by the way, was a famous prophet. His name's Isaiah. One of the biggest books that has the most prophecies about Jesus was written by this man. So how in the world was he able to do that? I got another story for you. Ezekiel, another guy, he laid on it. This, the, listen, you guys are going to think I have an obsession. These are all nudists over here. Ezekiel laid on his side for a year and a half, and a year and a half on the other side. And what he did is he cooked over animal waste. And that's when he ate the food. And why did he do that? Why was he able to obey God? God asked Isaiah to do it, and then God asked Ezekiel to do it. And how was he able to be that obedient to God? He lay on a year and a half every day. He would lay on his side. And what he was doing was he was giving a message to the city. Turmoil is coming over you unless you repent. And the Lord had him do that. But how does someone become so obedient to God? Because let's be real. In this room, we have a hard time with obedience to God. I'm not just talking Ten Commandments, y'all. I mean, that's hard enough. But I'm talking about even little things. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We have a hard time telling people about Jesus. I mean, we stumble over that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, that's not shame. I want to just be real with us all in here. We have a hard time with the gospel of Jesus. So and, and if it's true, if we really believe this is true, that this is the hope of glory, that Jesus Christ died for our sins and redeemed his people so we could walk out the purposes he planned for us, isn't this the best news in the world? So why is it so hard to get out? Why is it hard to walk to a stranger and say, hey, can I pray with you? And it not be like nerve-wracking, you know? What, what made these guys so much different? Well, that's not the only guy. I got another guy named John, John the Baptist. He was, this is, this is right when Jesus was born. They're born in the same year. John the Baptist was a wacko, man. I love this story. He, he would sit in the, in the riverbanks and said that he ate honey and locusts. That was his diet. That sounds great, you know? honey and locusts, and he sat in the riverbanks and he yelled out to people, you need to repent. You need to get baptized and repent for the one is coming after me whose sandals I'm not even worthy of like buckling. He's going, man, if you guys only knew, and he sat there and he gave his entire life 
preaching the gospel. And people thought he was so wild, they actually thought maybe this is the coming Messiah. Maybe this is what all the prophecies were about. This guy, he's wild. And I used to have this guy, Gary Scott, he's always describe him. You could just imagine, you know, he has like locust legs in his hair and honey dripping down his face. Right back, you know? Crazy. But I, I, I'm, I'm looking at these guys because we look at these guys and go, these guys are the greats. I told you three stories. Can I give you two more? Man, Moses, that's a crazy story. Moses is a crazy story. He went and faced the man who wanted him dead, Pharaoh. And what does he do? He says, hey, let my people go. <laughs> Culture, you made me feel good, bro. <laughs> he did. He said, let my people go, man. We're out of here. And then he, he basically goes to war with the strongest nation in the world for that time. And he goes to war with them, giving up his entire life, following. And then it gets worse. He picked up with people. How many of you guys get sick of people pretty quick? You want to get sick of people pretty quick? Two of us. The rest of y'all lying to me. You know you're lying to me. Some of y'all are here because you got sick of people. So you're here because you got to get a break. <laughs> Moses followed the Lord, and I want to say this, he gave up everything. He had land, he had property, he was a shepherd, which meant he was pretty rich because he had, he had animals, he had his family around him, and he gave up everything. What would cause someone to be that radical? We go to the next guy, Joshua. Joshua is insane. How many of you guys are on the Bible plan with us, man? I love the Bible plan. It's tight. Where have you reading the Bible plan? We're reading about how uh, just a few weeks ago, we read about Joshua and Moses. They're going to this land. It's the promised land. It's the most beautiful place in the world. But there's all these armies and nations in it. And God's like, you got to go through and destroy them. And the people go over there and they look at the people going, there's no way this is going to work. That's impossible. How many of you guys have ever been in that position? God, that's impossible. This isn't going to work out. There's no way, man, you're going to restore my life. There's no way you're going to redeem me. There's no way this is going to work out in my life. And Joshua comes back and says, no, our God could do it. In fact, he comes back so positive, it says in the scriptures that everybody hates him. In fact, they want him dead. I hate that dude. But then Joshua comes to actually live it out, not just talk about it, but he had to be about it. Don't talk about it, be about it. Man, I love that line. We need to make t-shirts that say that. Don't talk about it, be about it. Quote Jesus, yeah, facts. Check this out, y'all. So there's this one story. There's a lot of stories with Joshua, but this one's nuts. There's this, there's this army, Jericho. God said, you're going to destroy that city. Go and destroy it. And they have these huge walls. They're known for their protection. They're known for their defense. And so Joshua prays, God, what should we be doing? And God says this. This is what God tells them to do. This is insane. Y'all would quit at Christianity at this point. God says, I want you to march around that city seven times. And I don't want you to say a word. <laughs> you be thinking like, uh, I'm going crazy in my head, God. What are you talking about? He says, I want you to take the entire nation. I want you to march around that city seven days one time a day, and I don't want you to make a noise, but on the seventh day, after you circle around, I want you to shout out as loud as you can. I want you to scream out on top of your lungs. And Joshua obeyed. He didn't come up with another plan. This blows me away. He actually obeyed. That's crazy talk. Now, I'm, I'm saying this as an example in this room because I think everybody in here, when we talk crazy talk, when we say, you know what, God will provide for you, you always say the same thing. Yeah, but I got to do my part. We always say that. Well, you got to have wisdom. I think God will pull through with you. Well, I know, but i got to do this. You know what the only thing Joshua had to do was obey? Did you know that? That was the only key. Just obey me. Well, God, that doesn't, that's not how it works. That's not how you tear down walls. You need to go attack it, God. Could you imagine the counsel that Joshua would have got that day? I would have been tripped out, man. If I was following someone and they said, we're going to do that, I'd be like, okay, we're on the crazy train. Let's do this thing. And they do it, and the wall falls down. How did someone become so obedient? I'm talking about the most radical Christian, so radical that all of history knows about these guys. The Bible is the most popular book in the world ever, has been every single year since the Bible was put together back in the day. I don't know how long it's been, but the number one book since we've been keeping record. No book has even come close to that. And this is a book that contains the stories of these men. How did these men become the most famous people in the world? And the answer is this. They did not live for this life alone. They lived for eternity. And what happens when you live for eternity? You live differently. You live wild. 
You're crazy when you live for eternity. Imagine for a second if you found out today that there was some, you know, magical tree. If you ate the fruit, you would never die. Right? Sounds stupid, right? But how would you live? All of a sudden, you would live a little bit more reckless, wouldn't you? You would take a little bit more risk, wouldn't you? Oh, <laughs> yeah, you'd take, okay, chill out. All of a sudden, you would say, you know what? I don't need to get my 401k set up. I'm okay. I don't need to have a retirement plan. I don't need to have a good name even on this earth. I don't die. They will all die before I do. I'm okay. I can make this thing work. All of a sudden, you start living wild. And the reason why I'm bringing this up, because we're going to get into this. I've got a quick example for you guys. I didn't, if you know this sermon, you, I didn't bring rice, but I'm going to do something else. When you catch this thing, and you start really looking at things, you go, man, I'm gonna, there's an eternal lifestyle. Like God built me. He purposed you and I. He created you for eternity. I want to make that clear. It was his eternal plan. When he started, when he was forming you in the womb, he didn't say, oh, this is the perfect person for this life on earth. He said, no, no, this is the perfect person for all of eternity. This is someone who is not ever supposed to die. This is part of his plan in your life. And what happens is there's this great deception. I'll get right into this example, and I need a cable because I didn't tell these guys I was going to do it, so I'm going to steal your microphone cable. Is that okay, Eli? Thanks, Eli. I saw someone do this example, and I love this example. My, my, my friend, my brother in the Lord, Francis Chan, did this example. I love this example. So we're talking about these wild people and how they become such good Christians because you and I, we're struggling. We struggle in this Christian walk. And so I'm trying to tell you this key that they found out, this thing that they, they, they live out, these, these wild peoples, that they believed that this life wasn't the end. In fact, they believed that this life was literally just the beginning. If, if you were to compare it, imagine this cable right here, you know, it goes all the way up the stage. Imagine it just never ended. It went on forever. Like it never, this, this, this cable just continued going. You would never see the end. It never stopped. And let's just say that's what you are purpose for. This is eternity. And what happens as Christians and as people, we get so caught up on this little section right here. Life on earth. Our 60, well, actually, let's not even give ourselves 60s. I had a friend who, or a buddy of a buddy who just died of a heart attack at age 36. 30 to 100 years old, and we're focusing on this when God says, but I purposed you for all of eternity. That's what you were created for. You weren't created for this life on earth to be the end all be all. <laughs> when you think about this lifestyle and we say, man, we're eternally minded, we are people as a church who are so radically different because we don't believe that this is all we get. In fact, we're, we'll talk about this later, about stewardship. We believe that this life that we have today is actually just a management thing we have to do, but not our reward, which makes you live a different way. How many of you guys know that? Uh, I, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm going to tell you, me and my old wife, we, we're not so generous that it's like blow you away, but we have this desire in our heart that one day we could give away homes. Wouldn't that be so cool to buy a home and be able to give it away? Now, I want to say this. If you live for this earth, that's a terrible decision. That's taking a big investment and just handing it off to somebody else. But when you live for eternity, all of a sudden it's like, why wouldn't we do that? And let's get further. When you live for eternity, all of a sudden the big things, the big problems in life, oh, that person doesn't like me anymore becomes tiny little minuscule things. Actually, you know what else happens? When you have an eternal mindset, your heart for other people grows exponentially. Okay, I'll say it again. Thank you. When you live with an eternal mindset, your heart for people grows exponentially. What do I mean by that? When I look around this room, I believe in eternity, right? I believe in a forever life. I believe that when I die, I don't die. But that's not just me only. That's everybody I walk past. I know I teased you earlier, but that's you. That's Matthew over here. This guy right here believes he's called to go into ministry. That's Matthew. That's a dilly. 
That's Brandon. So what happens when you start seeing people as eternal beings? You start thinking about their eternal destination. And what happens when you start looking at their eternal destination? You don't care what they think about you today. You will preach the gospel to everyone you can because you understand how important it is. Well, how does this apply to me? How does this apply to us? I want us as a church to recognize that you and I are not living for the 60, 100 years on earth, but you live for a bigger picture, a grander picture. You live for heaven. You live for eternity. And if you could get a hold of that, I mean, seriously, if you could just grab that for a second, if you could just get it in your mind, like, wait a minute. When I die, it's not over. And you could grab that. All of a sudden, your entire goal list change. I, I don't care about being rich. I could be poor for the rest of my life. I'm not afraid of death. This is a big one. I'm not afraid of death. God, send me to, to North Korea where I can't even preach the gospel because I'll be in prison. I'm okay. I live for a greater day than today. All of a sudden, you become not a medium, lukewarm Christian, but you become a wild Christian, the kind of Christian God destined you to be. How many of you guys are Christians, professing Christians in here? Yeah? Look at this. Look at around. No, no, keep your hands up. I want you to look at each other. Don't, stop avoiding each other, all right? You guys are family here. Look at each other. Look how many Christians are in here. Now, now you've looked at each other. I want you to think about the most wild Christian you know. Think about the most wild Christian you know. Think about them. Think about them. You know what's crazy? You probably never once thought yourself. I don't. And that puts a little conviction in my heart. Wait a minute. I want to be the most wild Christian. What's holding me back? What am I living for on this earth? Am I just trying to build my finances? Am I trying to get secure? Am I trying to make sure I have a nice comfy house and a white picket fence, you know, and a good retirement fund and just enough money so I could give, but it doesn't hurt when I give? Uh, you know, when I talked about me and my wife giving houses, you, you, it sounds like we're saying we want to be so rich that we could give away houses and then not affect us. That's not what we're actually talking about. No, we want it to be so crazy. The people look at us and go, what is wrong with you? That's stupid. Don't you know that you only get this one life on this earth and we'll be able to say, no, 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 don't you know we have eternal life. Our God promised us in the scriptures, I resurrected from the dead and you will follow after me. You, he has given us eternal life and life abundantly. He even says knowing me is eternal life. I want to say this, it was his purpose for you, that you would be eternal. It's what he created you for. So who's fooled you into believing that you're supposed to live for the 60, 80 years on this world? Who's fooled you into believing that your purpose was so small? Who told you that you had to be comfortable in this life? Who's the one who spoke to you and said, you need to be an oppressor of men? Who's the one who told you that there's shame in living radically for Jesus? I'm asking you that. Who told you this? Who's got into your ear and said, no, no, this is the life that you should live? Who lied to you? Bill, I think I lied to myself too, bro. I've lied to myself. I told God, God, it's not honest what you're saying. We talked about faith earlier, about prayer being a, the most effective measuring stick for your faith. How you pray and when you pray and how often you pray, and if it's a personal relationship or not, is a great measuring stick for your faith. Your prayer life changes when you recognize you have an eternal life with Jesus. All of a sudden, the conversation isn't, God, help me now. The conversation is, God, be with me today. Or I'm going to be with you forever. So I want to close this thing up. Yeah, got to erase whatever that is. I covered a lot. A lot of it was stories. I told you about the most radical Christians, but there's some other Christians I want to tell you about. Some awesome Christians, and this one's, these are more recent. In China, back in early 2000, I think it was eight, maybe it was 2007, uh, they came down on an underground church. The pastor, two children, and a wife. And this is a real story. I, I'll try to figure out the names again. I used to have the story. Uh, written out. I was on a magazine. It was published. 
The pastor, his two kids and wife got busted. The church got broken up, and they're going to kill the pastors. And they said, hey, listen, you're going to denounce your church, and you're going to break the church up, and you're going to let your people know you're going to break it up. And you're going to end this. Well, it's over for your family and you. And the pastor, because they're in this dirt area, I don't know where they're at. Some, the, the description of the story was that they're on top of a mound, and they're going to push the dirt over them and kill them. They're going to kill them and bury them, basically. And uh, the pastor was told that the ultimatum was that he does that or his family dies. And this is what happens. The story's crazy. The pastor being told to denounce Christianity and go back and break up the church or else his family dies is looking at his children and his children say, don't do it, Dad. Don't deny our Lord. You know what's cool about those kids? Because we talk about this as adults and it's crazy that we're adults talking about this. But their kids knew, God, it's worth dying for, Dad. You got eternity with him. Don't do it. And the story is he didn't do it, but the whole family got killed for it, including him. They died. How can you become a person who dies for the gospel unless you believe in the eternity of Jesus Christ? How many of you guys have ever, uh, I, I want to end this, but I keep telling, I remind myself of little stories I want to tell you guys. How many of you guys remember being, uh, well, how many of you guys were raised in the church? You want to hear raised in the church? Now, yeah, how many of you guys uh, remember the Left Behind series and the old, yeah, oh my gosh, terrifying, right? Yeah, the balloon floating away. You're like, oh my God, I'm going to miss it. And like every time I came home, me and Ham would come home from school and my parents were home, I was for sure God came back and I missed it. I was like positive every time. And I, I remember um, seeing that and, and, and being freaked out by that. In God's return, what was I going to tell you guys about this? Because it was a great story, but I forgot now. Oh, I, I, we were raised up, and we we're always asked this question. If someone put a gun to your head today and said, deny Christ, would you do it? And as a youth kid, I would be like, no, we would never do it. You know? <laughs> Bring the guns. We're not going to die. We're, we'll, we'll never deny Christ, no? But then as life went on, I remember being in high school here in Georgia. And uh, I remember kind of actually weighing that out of my head. Man, what if someone did actually say they're going to kill me. I have a lot to live for. You know, I was a teenager. I really didn't have that much to live for, but I thought I did. You know, there's a cute girl at school. Sorry, Susie. There's a cute girl at school. You know, I don't want to die. You know, I have hopes at the time I wanted to be an NBA star. I was playing basketball like crazy. If you want to hoop with me, I'll beat you, bro. What's up? <laughs> That's not true, is it, Adelia? Yeah, me and Adelia were on the team together. We were the worst team in the entire league. Yeah, we suck. No, but... Uh, but I remember like weighing out, and I remember in my head being really honest with myself, going, would I die for the gospel? Like, would I take a bullet just to say, I'm not going to deny Christ? Like, oh, no, I'm not going to deny Christ. Or, or would I say, okay, I deny Christ, I deny Christ, and justify it in my head and say, oh, he will forgive me. And isn't there so much more that I could do if I'm living to preach the gospel? Now, I remember in high school thinking, I don't know if I would take a bullet. If they said deny Christ, I'm like, okay, God, I don't like you. You know, fingers crossed, you know? <laughs> and I would try to work my way around it because I wasn't secure in the belief that I have eternal life. I was frozen by this lie that you and I have told ourselves. This life that we live is more important than the life out there. This little section is more important than that 99.99999% of eternity. And since we bought that lie, you and I have fallen into a lukewarm Christianity. Now, lukewarm Christianity is this, that we're consumed more. I'm not saying only by. We're consumed more by the things of this world, the security of this world, more consumed by the thoughts of other people around us, the thoughts of people in this room. We've been consumed by how it's going to work and how I have to make it work. And in that, we've taken away our trust in God's everlasting promises that if you seek first my kingdom and its righteousness, I will take care of all these things for you. And then we forgot that God says the world will hate you. Stop making them try to love you. They're going to hate you. It's my promise to you. And we let it go. And we let go of the security, and God says, you're an ambassador, not a citizen of this earth. You're not secure. 
You're secure in eternity, but not on this earth. And we've traded it all. And in doing so, we've become this Christianity where we are just this like cuddly, you know, we like the love feelings, right? And we're not real radical about it. And when we go to preach the gospel, the gospel gets watered down because we don't want people to feel bad because they might dislike it, right? And all of a sudden, our lukewarm Christianity becomes, man, I don't know if I could be that radical. I used to be that radical, but I had to give it up because that's crazy. That's, that's not me anymore. And we've dismissed it. And I want to say this is the root cause. You forgot that God purchased eternity for you. And that this life on earth is just a time to be a light in a dark place. Not a place to build your kingdom. Not a place to build your name. Not a place to even build your security. Let the home fly away. Let the job title disappear. May I die hanging on to one thing. I believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and I have eternity. And I won't go after anything else. And when you do this, and if you guys could do this with me as a church, and you grab onto this idea of eternity, you will be a minister of the gospel. You can't help it. It's like seeing a truck coming to hit somebody. Now, if there's a semi-truck coming down, it's going to hit Steve, right? And we see the semi-truck coming. You're not going to be like, well, I'm not telling Steve it's coming. <laughs> You're going to say, Steve, there's a truck coming. Watch out. You know, hopefully one of you guys would run and do one of those heroic dives, you know, grab them and tumble out. The same thing happens when you believe in eternity. All of a sudden you look at people and it's not, it's not just, oh, well, they reject me. Now you're looking at them going, wait a minute, there's something great here. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss. I got to tell you. I mean, you're stupid. Get out of here. But I know, I know, but you got to hear it. I got a brother. He's my brother. He's my hero, PJ. He was my hero growing up. He's a filmmaker. He's the reason why I like getting into videos. That's why I started vlogging. PJ is my dude, right? I used to call him up all the time about acting. PJ does not like God. He said to me and a few others, I believe in God. I just hate him. I don't like him. And he hates God. And every time I want to talk to him about God, I get so nervous. But then I remember something. God, I never, ever want to be the person who didn't speak up and say something to him. So I do every once in a while. Me and PJ don't talk much, but every once in a while I throw something to PJ. Praying for you, Peach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know how it feels. Can I pray with you? And not once has it been, you know, it's not like Peach is like, yes, I've been waiting. <laughs> You're like, get out of here with that. But I'm not going to be the one. I want to encourage you, don't be the one. Believe in eternity. Have an eternal mindset. So let me recap. Once you start believing in eternity, you live wild. You're crazy. You become the crazy Christian. You no longer look warm. You can't. When you believe in eternity, you start living wild. Number two, you can't go without preaching the gospel to those who are lost because you go, I see, yet you have eternity. And number three, when you live with an eternal mindset, the woes of this world seem like nothing. As Paul says it, this, the pain of this world, the hardships, the terribleness, the wars, the rumors of wars, the craziness, doesn't compare to the glory that we get to have in heaven with him. This is just a flickering light to the glory that we get to be with Jesus Christ. So as a church, a core value that we have, and I can say it simply, is that we, we can say, oh, we believe in the Bible. <laughs> but this is actually how I want to see it. Well, we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, temporal, temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. God, we live for the eternal lifestyle. As a church, I'm asking us to grab on to prayer, but also eternal mindset. I'm going to live for eternity. How big of a problem is this in the scope of eternity? Almost every one of your problems will disappear. Almost all your prayers turn into praise. God, you're just so good. I don't know what to pray. Like I could ask, you know, I'm hungry right now, and I could ask that someone to buy me a burger, but honestly, God, I got all eternity with you. I, mean, I can't wait. We've become people like Paul who says, man, it's, to die is to gain. It's better to be in heaven with you, God, but to live is for your glory. I, I'll do that. As a church, I'm asking you guys to do something. Start believing when he says you have eternity with him and have your life change. And I'm going to say this. It's easier said than done. You're going to be a wacko. You're going to be a weirdo. That's a weird way to live. The entire world is living to protect their life. 
The entire world lives a protected life. And Christians, well, if you read the Bible, we're the ones who walk right into death. Isaiah goes and gets sawed in half. The disciples get boiled alive, hung on crosses. Paul gets stoned to death. And stoned to death is not like they're throwing pebbles. They're crushing people with rocks. And when Paul comes back to life, he says, I got to go back in there. Because death, you have no stink. Where is your victory? I live eternally. So Father, I pray over all of us tonight, Jesus, that God, we would recognize that we are eternal people. And the truth is, Father, this is a, it's not so, it's funny because it doesn't have to be heavy, but it feels heavy because to live this way means to change. And to change means to give up things. And to give up things means to trust you and to really believe what you say is true. And God, it is tough. But God, I've never seen your children beg. Because, Father, you are a good father to those who follow hard after you. You're a good father to those who mess up, God. You are a good father. So, God, I pray over all of us, Jesus, that you help us grasp this, God. Now, Father, we would live wild. God, we would look at Isaiah and go, okay, I actually understand why he did that. We look at Ezekiel and say, that sounds disgusting, but I get it. He lived not for this day of age. That we can look at John the Baptist with his locust and his locust legs and his beard and honey dripping down his face and go, okay, I get it. And we could be encouraged to say, you know what? I don't live for this age or this world. I live for my God who is in heaven. So God, we worship you and we praise you in the name as we pray. We hope you enjoyed today's sermon. Once again, if you'd like to support this ministry, log on to www.dreamcenterchurch.com where every dollar advances the kingdom of God. Until next time, be blessed and go do the great things God has called you to do.